my name is Father Michael Himes in the Department of Theology at Boston College, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome two dear friends and two very distinguished theologians. That's us. Father Michael Buckley and uh, Professor Nicholas Lash. Father Buckley has taught at uh, the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley at the University of Notre Dame and at uh, Boston College and is now at um, Santa Clara University in California. Professor Lash is the former Norris Hulse Professor of Divinity in Cambridge University. Uh, the occasion of our being together is that Father Buckley's former students, many of whom are now teaching in colleges and universities around the United States, decided to arrange a conference honoring Father Buckley by considering the role of the teacher in theology. And since we had both Professor Lash and Father Buckley here <coughs> with us at Boston College at the same time, we thought it would be a wonderful thing to have a conversation with the two of them recorded uh, for all of you and indeed for posterity. So if posterity is watching in, straighten up, this is for your benefit. Uh, let me begin by asking Father Buckley and then ask uh, Professor Lash to join in. Michael, um, how would you describe your own work as a theologian? Uh, what I mean is there are various terms that are out there. People talk about systematic theology, dogmatic theology, <coughs> philosophical theology, fundamental theology. And very often the word, the, the terms change their meaning depending on who's using them. How would you describe yourself and your work as a theologian? Um, that's a difficult question, but not an impossible one. Um, it seems to me the theologian is primarily interested in God and all of the things because of God. That somehow or other, they, they probe or describe or focus on the mystery of God, the incomprehensibility of God. That doesn't mean you can't know God at all. It does mean that what you know is mystery. And the more that you know it, the more mysterious it becomes. So if you were to ask me, what do you mean by theology? I would say theology is a discipline, a, a study, a whatever, uh, that focuses very much upon the reality of God. And all the other forms of theology, moral theology, historical theology, and so forth, all do that in terms of the single focus. Fine. Nicholas? But the trouble with the labels you mentioned is that they all have particular historical, cultural origins. Uh, for example, systematic theology, first invented in the early modern period for Protestant theology, and Catholics prefer to, prefer to describe the same work as dogmatics. A friend of mine, an American theologian, great distinction, being in a meeting of Pope John Paul II a few years ago, and the Pope said, um, <coughs> what is your subject? And he said, um, systematic theology. And John Paul II poked him on the chest and said, no, he said, dogmatic theology. <laughs> um, <coughs> in England, uh, the concept of fundamental theology, which is familiar to Catholics, I think Karl Rahner described it as, as theology reflecting on its own identity formally and so on, um, isn't known. So I, if I were working in France or Germany, I would probably be described as a fundamental theologian, whereas working in England, I'm normally described as a philosophical theologian. It doesn't really matter, providing one can identify what one's doing, and Father Buckley did that, and he implicitly quoted Thomas Aquinas, who <clears throat> described the task of the theologian as inquiring about God and all things in relationship to God, their origin and destiny. And that, I think, is what we try to do. Right. Your father Buckley is always implicitly <coughs> quoting Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> That's right, but he's not quoting me. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you think back over your careers as theologians, what has changed in Catholic theology? How is the situation of Catholic theology in the English-speaking world different now than it was when you began teaching? Michael? In some ways, let me just start it off. In some ways, the, um, the div division or distinction is really radical. In my halcyon carefree days as a youth, uh, when we took systematic theology or dogmatic theology, it was a series of theses uh, 
propositions about God that we thought were true and that could be demonstrated. And uh, it didn't really make a great deal of difference um, uh, how it affected your life. What it did is it, it simply proved the coherence and the veracity of Catholic thought or Catholic dogma. I think that would be an impossible course to teach seriously now. I think that in the United States, certainly, and I believe in Europe also, the emphasis is very strongly upon experience, not just experience, but experience is a component of almost anything, whether it be literary criticism, whether it be history, whether it be whatever. So that if, if you're going to teach a course in systematic theology, you would have to see how this engaged the life and the, um, the reality of the students. And the, consequently, God, the, uh, the God becomes a figure or a, uh, um, uh, 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 God becomes a, what do I say? Uh, uh, God becomes a mystery. Let's leave it at that. God becomes a mystery within which everything else is situated, but it has to be some way, in some way, bound up in the uh, uh, psychophysical, uh, poetic, uh, streams that go into human experience. That's a little clumsy, but basically I think that's correct. I think the, the thing that distinguishes contemporary theology very strongly is the accent upon experience. Mm -hmm. Not just experience, but experience. Right. And that's a, a, a major shift from... I, I think so. Don't you think so? Yeah. Oh, Compare think, that I, with the manualists. I think it's certainly grown immensely in the last 30, 35 years. <laughs> Nicholas, how would you... <coughs> I can think of three ways where, where things have changed profoundly. One, where, at least where England is concerned, and I'm now thinking not only of Catholic theology, but of Christian theology in general, is when I first began to teach theology in Cambridge over 40 years ago, you could take for granted that any young person who decided to read theology at university rather than physics or Russian history uh, went to church and said their prayers, read the Bible. And now you get people saying, I say, did you say two testaments? That's interesting. You know, I mean, I mean, so we're starting from a totally uncatechized base normally. So we have to try and do the, the elemental cate elementary catechetical work as well as make the theologically yes. literate and so on. Another uh, major change um, um, is that there used to be <coughs> in Catholic theology uh, a rather cumbersome system, what we call theological notes. That is to say, you knew whether a proposition was a dogmatic, defined dogma, a perfectly respectable thing you can think, daft, heretical, you know. Offensive to pious now, ears. this system may have been rather baroque and cumbersome, but at least it, uh, it brought out the importance of discriminating. Now we tend, I'm afraid, to talk very largely and loosely about the teaching of the church. Right. And there is no sunk, such single chunky thing. Uh, you need to know what the difference between belief in um, the divinity of Christ and um, someone's odd view on indulgences or whatever. And, and uh, the third thing, the profound change I was going to mention, yes, concerns the disappearance of giants. When we were young, there were the great men. There was Conga, Rana, de Lubac, von Balthasar, etc. Now you look around and say, where, 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 who, where, the, where, where are the great stars? Some people think, therefore, it's gone downhill. But many years ago, discussing this question with the great um, Belgian theologian, Edris Skelebex, he had a different take on it. He said, those people, the great men of the 40s, 50s, brought us out of the deadness of modern scholasticism into a much richer contact with Catholic sources, imagination, history, and so on. And they did their job well. In other words, the quality of Catholic theology in the English-speaking world, oh, and, and more broadly, overall is much, much higher than it was in the 30s and 40s. And that's why we don't need the mountain peaks. That's very interesting. Well, uh, uh, that leads me to a question about <coughs> what you see as the present state of Catholic theology in the English-speaking world. What do you see as the most promising signs or or uh, factors in the situation for Catholic theology in the English-speaking world at the present time? And what do you see as the, the greatest difficulty or the, the most threatening or discouraging factor? The most promising, certainly, uh, again, I, I concentrate on my own country, it's easier, but by contrast, I think the United States, 
40 years ago, <clears throat> um, British Catholic theology was almost exclusively uh, clerical mm -hmm. and largely <clears throat> um, carried out in the houses and studies of the great religious orders, the better seminaries right. and so on. Um, in the last 50 years, it's moved out into the British university, the public secular universities, and has become largely lay. Uh, at, in consequence of which, about just over 40 years ago, some of us were slightly worried that the, the new, more lay theology might move out of conversation with the, with the clerical religious house, uh, studies, houses one. So we set up a thing known as the Catholic Theological Association, you have a similar one in this country, to keep all these people together. That body now has a flourishing annual conference with a couple of hundred people and so on. That couldn't have happened 50 years ago. That, that's a great strength. Weakness. Um, the first course I ever taught in this country was uh, in the early 70s at Notre Dame. And people said, what are you teaching? And I said, well, Frank Sullivan, who is the chairman of the department, he thinks I'm talking about doctrinal development. I'm trying to persuade the young that doctrine changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I st still think we have a, an inadequate grasp of the thoroughly historical character of Catholic life and thought. So the, 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 the question should be, how does Christianity, how does the preaching of the gospel maintain its identity through constant change, not trying to pretend that it doesn't change at all? Yes, and not trying to pretend that uh, every change is development, and not a decline right. or a passing away. Yeah. Michael. Well, I would say the most promising thing is the dialogue with the other Christian religions and then also a party with the non-Christian religions. Mm -hmm. I think the um, resolute conviction that God speaks through many different forms of religious worship and religious credence is much com more common now than it was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very helpful because I think, first I think it's true, and I think being open to these, this diversity makes us open to the experiences of people who can in some way adumbrate the experience that we're going through. I'm amazed, for example, at the number of Jesuits who are involved in Zen Buddhism. And it's not that one opposes the other, Catholicism versus Zen Buddhism. It's rather they're seen as complementary and often feeding one into the other without kind of a, a guileless naivete. So I think that's possibly the most important, the, the expansion of the conviction of religious consciousness I think also the, the, the with, with, together with that, the tolerance that goes with that and the openness to more forms of expression mm -hmm. than we have seen so far. So I would put those on the positive. Negatively, <laughs> it's always easy to do the negative, but I negatively... Don't a name at this point. You don't, don't, don't mention anyone in particular <laughs> when you're thinking about the name. I have the list of names right here. <laughs> <laughs> the, ne negatively, I would say the... Um, uh, the, uh, I got distracted. Um, my pass, I'll, it'll come back. Fine. Um, this is, will be a little different given your two experiences. Uh, Professor Lash having spent his uh, career <laughs> at Cambridge University Father Buckley having been taught at several uh, specifically Catholic schools, universities in this country. But uh, I'd, I'd be interested in your reflection on the relationship between the theologians on, at these universities and all of their colleagues on the faculty, not just their relationship with the students, but what do you see as your role as a theologian in the university community, in the faculty of that of the university, um, Pope John Paul II <coughs> wrote an encyclical about these matters um, and talked about the enormous importance of um, philosophy recovering a sense of being wisdom, not just technical expertise. Something similar might go for, for theology, uh, and the connection of the conversation between all the disciplines. Well, that's a fine, uh, a fine ambition and goal. But having worked for 40 years in, uni in a university with a very vast, it's almost, almost all patterns of inquiry are now so specialized that it's immensely difficult to get this conversation going. Um, over 30 years ago, uh, a friend of mine, uh, um, well, four of us, set up a, a body known as the Triangle in Cambridge. 
uh, this was meant to be theology, philosophy, science. We then realized that being came, we had to have a four-cornered triangle, theology, philosophy, the hard sciences, the social sciences, and so on. It's terribly informal. We meet once a term over dinner, and at coffee, someone reads a short paper, and we discuss things. Now, that's a group of about 20 people out of a faculty of whatever it is, a thousand or two. And it's immensely difficult to keep the physical and uh, biological sciences on board. It's quite easy to get the philosophers and the sociologists and the theologians talking together, historians, but the f physicists, biologists, geologists, very difficult to keep in, in that conversation. Without which, of course, theology, if, if theology loses contact with all the, the other patterns of inquiry and expertise, it cannot be what Aquinas wants it to be, which is the study of all things in their relationship right. to God. I agree with that. <laughs> I, I think that's quite correct. And the, um, uh, in fact, I, gave, I think I gave a talk at the Triangle Club. You did indeed. I did. Yes. That's right. I remember very vividly. The, um, um, uh, what, what, let, me, let me have the question once more, please. What do you see as the, re as the relationship between your work as a theologian on the faculty and all of the other uh, colleagues that yes. you have in other fields, okay. departments? Ooh. I think what theology does is it pushes each of the things, each of the sciences, each of the considerations and disciplines into a sense of both who they are and where they're going, what kind of questions they're asking. So the questions, if, if you're dealing with biology or astrophysics or whatever, that somehow or other these things are pushed till they engage questions of ultimacy. And when they engage questions of ultimacy, that there is the possibility of the theologian making a significant contribution. Mm -hmm. The great problem is that so few theologians are really acquainted with the sciences. Mm -hmm. The result of the, is that they will often say things that are intolerable for the sciences. If it's any consolation, the sciences do the same thing with theology. But the, I would say the, the great challenge for contemporary theology, or a great challenge for contemporary theology, is the recognition of the implication of all the disciplines and sciences. And as people do this, this will lead you inevitably, in fact, I think it does lead you inevitably, into theology. And of course, there's the other side of this one. I mean, both Father Buckley and I, 30 years ago, perhaps nearly now, took part in, in a seminar at the Papal Villa in Castle Gandolfo. Um, this was the occasion was the second bicentenary of the publication of Newton's Principia. And the Pope thought that there ought to be a discussion of the relations between theology, philosophy, and the sciences to mark this occasion. And um, during our conversation, uh, a very distinguished Jesuit uh, astrophysicist, Bill Steger, asked me, what do you think as a theologian, what do you most importantly learn from the physical sciences? which I think is a terribly important question, a very difficult one to answer. Yes, and for better or for worse, what I said was, I think what I most learned, at least from disciplines like his, is to, I acquire some sense of the sheer unimaginable vastness of the world. <laughs> Since uh, this celebration in your honor this weekend, Michael, is uh, concentrating on the role of the teacher uh, and the two of you are certainly very eminent and very, uh, very gifted teachers. What would you, as you think back over your career now, specifically as teacher, what is it that you would most want to have communicated to your students? I think the mystery of God is beckoning, that the, um, the very things that Nicholas has mentioned, each one of which is, gives a certain slant on a mystery that pulls you further and further into its own uh, incomprehensibility. Incomprehensibility not meaning unintelligible, but incomprehensible, be endlessly intelligible. And that as that draws you, and as there is a sense that not only of being drawn, but desire and also love for the reality that is there that increasingly discloses itself, I would want the students to pick that up. I do not want them to study what they do not love in any way. I think that's an enormous mistake. And um, not to push Bonaventure strongly over St. Thomas, uh, 
but one of the great gifts of the whole Franciscan school has been this synthesis between affectivity and intelligence. I would want the students to have that. I think very similarly, there is a, a, a friend of mine, a very distinguished philosopher, who is an atheist of such passionate conviction that if he sniffs out a student in his class who, who is a Christian, he would do his damnedest to destroy that person's faith. Now, I do not think that conversely that it's my job as a professor of theology in the classroom to be making converts. Nevertheless, I, in, the answer to your question, mine would be very similar to Michael, which would be, at the end of the day, I want to inculcate in them some sense of wonder. That's splendid. That's splendid. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I've been finding in recent years, I say often to students that they, to distinguish philosophy and theology for them, I say to them, the great question for philosophy, obviously a question theologians are interested in, but a specifically theological question is, does God exist? Is there God? But the great theological question is, does God care? Is God engaged with God's creation? Is, is, it, it, does it make any sense to say that God is love? So uh, God as beckoning, as you described it, Michael. God well, it's, it's, it's really the, uh, at the beginning of the Confessions, Augustine has done that thing that everybody quotes, the first two chapters, the first two paragraphs. But just before he begins his own history, he asks God a final question. Quid tibi sum ipse domine ut jubias te amaria me? Why do I mean so much to you, my God, that you have commanded me to love you? The, the wonderment is that God cares at all. Right. But, and the, the insistence of the church and of uh, systematic theology is that God does, uh, this, as we study it, God does care. And to probe the care of God and to be part of the care of God and to bring the care of God um, to its finality, to a, a fulfillment, it seems to me it's part of the function of theology. I, I've often quoted a remark I heard the Australian Jesuit uh, Jerry O'Collins uh, make over 40 years ago. He, d he described the theologian as someone who watches their language in the presence of God, uh, in, uh, in contrast to which I sometimes define the philosopher as someone who watches his language. Uh -huh, yes. <laughs> watches his what? Watches his language. language. Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've spoken a little bit about uh, your role as theologian in the university. What do you see your role, and therefore the role of your students as they move into uh, teaching positions, what do you see as their role, their responsibility, their engagement with the church? I don't want to move to sound too critical here, but I'm going to, I think, because um, I think the problem is as grave in this country as it is in Britain. And that is the lack of interest that our bishops have in theological, in, in theology and in theological education. Um, um, one of the English bishops I, I was talking to, I, who I know very well, two or three years ago, I said, you, by the way, you know, any time you'd like, would you like me to give a few talks to the priests of your diocese? Oh, no, he said, they're not interested in theology. Now, in this sort of climate, not hostility <laughs> to theological inquiry, um, but simply lack of interest in it, it makes the theologian's job especially difficult. Since where Britain is concerned, well, in Germany, there is a strong tradition of the bishops' conference always including a handful of bishops who are also theologians, major scholars. You don't need too many of them. We do need enough to remind all the bishops that, that these patterns of inquiry and reflection matter. In England, since the death of Bishop Christopher Butler, we have had no member of our bishops' conference who is capable of holding down a job in a theology department in a decent British university. And therefore, unsurprisingly, the questions don't arise. And I rather suspect that the situation is similar in the States. The thing about theology is you're going to do it whether you want to or not. You're going to be making theological statements about God, about the reality of God, and that is a very big deal. For someone to claim to make anything uh, a statement about God is to claim an, an ultimate in levels of human knowledge. I am amazed at the number of uh, people 
both priests and bishops and lay people and so forth, that uh, for whom it's exactly as Nicola said, the, the science is simply OCOs. We're not interested in that. And we're interested in, in social problems. We're interested in uh, uh, moral, uh, moral problems. But, but the idea that you would speak about God or about God's presence in human life or that God is touching human life, that seems so abstract. Now, part of that is because of the thing we mentioned at the very beginning, the, kind, the quality of theology that they were exposed to. But the other is simply awful because it doesn't mean you're not going to make theological statements. You're going to make all sorts of them. They're inescapable. You'll just make them bad. Like you're that. going to make a lot of dumb, injurious statements. Yes. So I would, um, yeah, I agree with Nicholas 100%. I think the, the, um, the idea that theology is simply a, a pastime for abstract thinkers, which may have been much more common then, 20 years ago, than it is now, I think that day has to pass. And the, this puts a concomitant um, uh, obligation on the bishops is they've got to encourage good theology. They have to send people to do it. They have to have places where it's done. And they have to encourage by the freedom they allot. They, they have to, he has to encourage the kind of freedom that makes for theological reflection. I think the, the, uh, there is at least, I think, uh, uh, one uh, profound difference in situation in this country and in, 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 in my own, because in this country, I, my impression is that most Americans still regard themselves as, as Christians, as believers in God. Uh, and this cultural assumption must have uh, an impact on the questions we're discussing. Very different situation in, uh, in Britain, where we are so profoundly secularized that it is assumed that to be a Christian is to be very eccentric. You see. Mm -hmm. I was talking um, a couple of years ago to the Anglican Bishop of Durham, who is a very distinguished New Testament scholar. And he said to me, um, how is it, why is it that ecumenical relations between the Church of England and the Catholic Church in England have got sort of stagnant recently? And I know him well enough to say, well, for a start, given the present state of the Anglican Communion, are you entirely surprised? And I said, but another matter, I said, why doesn't your lot get together with my lot and tackle questions of much, much more fundamental importance, on which there's no difference between us at all? And um, Tom Wright said, um, such as? And I said, evangelization. He said, that's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> We're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, one of the things that occurs to me about, uh, as an example of what you've just been saying in this country, certainly, is um, as a diocesan priest myself, I'm very concerned about the fact that precious few dioceses in the United States have in the last 25 years sent any clergy or even encouraged clergy of their own to seek advanced degrees in any area of theology other than perhaps canon law. I mean, the bishops uh, uh, think that they have to keep the diocesan <laughs> chanceries and marriage tribunals staff. So they'll send priests for, uh, to do graduate work in canon law. But nobody in diocesan clergy, precious few, are doing any serious work in um, scripture, yeah. in, uh, in uh, doctrinal theology, historical theology, uh, Christian ethics. That's, that's simply not being done at all. Can I add a little autobiographical note on that? Many years ago, when I was a seminarian, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a, a wonderful parish priest, ex excellent pastoral liturgist, because my bishop then was threatening to send me to Rome to do a doctorate in canon law. And I said to this priest, I said, oh, Jimmy, I said, I can't go and become a canon lawyer. He said, you must, my dear, he said, mind the fortress from within. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be nice to think of all those people going to study canon law actually being double agents. Yes. <laughs> but yes. I, I, I have a suspicion that that's too optimistic of you. <laughs> um, one of the things that emerges from what we've just been saying is that, can, that uh, the doing of theology at the present time is very much more an enterprise of laymen and laywomen than it used to be. We yes. said that earlier. Uh, how do you see that shaping theology uh, differently in, in the future? I think it will introduce into theology whole levels of experience that up to this time have at least been articulate and by and large absent. Mm 
I think that uh, to get people with the normal experience of Catholic families <coughs> and so forth is to, to introduce into the study of theology the life of the church, a life of the church that has been for the most part absent. So I think I see nothing but good coming out yeah. of that. I, perhaps the, uh, the biggest obvious difference is the increasingly large proportion of theologians were women. Right. Uh, that's one. On a kind of po positive note, clearly a positive note, um, in the University of Durham, which is one of the oldest and most distinguished universities in Britain, there has been um, established in the last couple of years a chair, this is a, 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 public, a, secular, a public secular university, a chair in Roman Catholic theology, which is um, um, the, the, the person elected uh, to occupy this chair becomes ipso facto theological advisor to the bishop of the Catholic diocese. Oh, now that cooperation between the secular university and the Catholic diocese is quite unusual in England. Yes. This is unique and I think it's very encouraging. Yes, it would be unique in this country so far as I know. I don't it would be very unique. Yes, <laughs> yes that's, that's remarkable. Yes, well, uh, certainly I agree with you about the experience. I mean, uh, the fact is that if you think back 25, 30 years ago, uh, as regards marriage, we had an elaborate canon law dealing with marriage, and we had a, an elaborate moral theology dealing with human sexuality, but we really had no sacramental theology of the sacrament of marriage. No. Because the people who did theology professionally, for the most part, were celibates. Um, that's now changing uh, entirely. There's a, a great uh, excitement and ferment about uh, theology of marriage and theology of parenthood and theology of family life, domestic church, etc. at the present time. But that's, that's clearly a result of that shift. Yeah, t taking off from what both of you have said, I think <coughs> excuse me, that the most serious question facing the church in the United States, the most serious, is the quality of its bishops. I think that all the other programs that can be instigated or enthusiasms that can be clung to or whatever, all of those will do some good. But unless they have a solid foundation upon an episcopate that is both learned and wise and courageous and, and priestly, if you don't have that, then you're building upon sand. I think, I, I'm not sure how you go about doing this, and there are many bishops that are very holy and devout men. I'm not, not denying that. But the, um, the kind of thing that was typical of the church almost for the first thousand years, I think is uh, deplorably absent now, and that is the learned holy episcopate. Mm -hmm. And where that will go, I don't know. But I don't think any of the things that we have mentioned so far are going to be, um, are going to be uh, attended to comparably until we get that kind of episcopate. And I don't think you're going to get that until you have extended in the selection of bishops the criteria by which these are made and the people who make them. Could I um, risk being specific on, on this issue? I entirely agree. Because the doctrine, the classical Catholic doctrine of, of the reception of doctrine is not to the effect uh, that, as people say, the church is a democracy, blah, 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 nonsense. It is that when, uh, when the, the authorities in the church uh, proclaim something with solemnity, if it is from the heart of the, of the tradition, the people of God say, yes, that's it, that's it. And if the people of God don't say, yes, that's it, something's gone wrong with the proclamation. Yes. Now, the classic instance of this in the last half century, of course, is the encyclical Humani Vitae, or not in general, but in specific, the claim that all uses of contraception whatsoever are intrinsically evil. That particular tiny piece of teaching has not been received. The people of God have not said, yes, that's it, I think. If then for 40 years you make it a condition of the appointment of a priest to the episcopate that is entirely in agreement with Humani Vitae and that key proposition, you are bound to, uh, uh, ex ex to cut out from the episcopate a huge range of intelligent, gifted, dedicated priests. Yes. I would like to second that. I think that's absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah, and, and it seems to me it's an interplay, uh, uh, would you agree, of four issues, all of which have to be dealt with. Who chooses bishops? Who are the kinds of people chosen for bishop? What is the process by which the, the, the choice is made? 
and what do we think the office is that we're choosing them for? Yeah. You know, that, I mean, uh, I, I think this often when I hear people describe uh, the Episcopate of the first thousand years as you did, Michael, that the um, uh, that uh, think of the job description of an Augustine or a Chrysostom mm -hmm. or an Athanasius. Then think of the job description yeah. of the bishop of a major metropolitan see in the United States at the present time. I mean, to be uh, Archbishop of New York or Los Angeles or Chicago or Boston. Uh, it, it, it's a job of such immense administrative complexity that you're left saying is the sort of person who will have these administrative gifts. Is that the sort of person likely to have the gifts of somebody who is a theologian or a biblical exegete or a uh, uh, an ethician? I, I probably not. Sadly, if I remember rightly, um, Eve Conger used to say that the biggest single shift in Catholic ecclesiology occurs sometime in the twelfth, thirteenth century, when our understanding of episcopacy shifted from being that of of of, the, of symbolic pastoral leadership to that of running things. Right. <laughs> uh, what's our model of episcopacy? And it, it is, I'm afraid, <coughs> that of the second millennium, not the first. Yes, the odd know. thing is that uh, the church in the first thousand years, give or take a hundred years <laughs> there, the first thousand years, the church did have uh, a, a more of a democratic form of the selection of bishops. I have a number of quotations here. Celestine the first saying, the one who is to be uh, presented for all must be chosen by all. Mm -hmm. Uh, let no one be imposed upon the faithful whom they do not want. That's all in the fifth century. And th that, and that goes all the way back. You can trace all the way back to the origins of the monarchical episcopate. And the, many people think that the reason why you have a more monarchical structure of government now in the church without the kind of selection they had previously or democratic forms was because when the kings and uh, powerful nobles or powerful ecclesiastics took over that area, they excised from that all the democratic forms, and the appointment to the episcopate became just another significant, powerful job within the Roman Empire, mm. or the Holy Roman Empire. I think, I, I'm not sure how one goes about this, I'm not sure how one persuades the members of the hierarchy or the, the priest that it's terribly important to at least consider the return to the early usages of the church. But I think unless that is attended to, everything else is, is ephemeral, as I mentioned. Well, let me close uh, our conversation by asking the two of you, um, as distinguished teachers of theology, um, what do you see as the, uh, the strongest foundation uh, for hope and the, as, uh, as, as you think about your graduate students, the people who are the next generation of theological teachers, what would you offer them as uh, a, a basis for hope and uh, encouragement in going forward? Hope in general or hope for theology? Hope for theology, but hope in general. <laughs> Hope in general, I, I think the resurrection is a good thing. <laughs> I've uh, always been in favor of the resurrection. <laughs> I would mean, hurt your openness. Um, well, I suppose, because as well as the, uh, as the, as the critical things we've said, I, I, I pointed out, I mentioned a number of kind of encouraging signals where Catholic theology in England is concerned. It's, it's increasing uh, involvement of women, increasing involvement of, of, of lay people, etc. So, so the, I think there are signs of, of growing grass. It's not all dead hay. Right. Yeah, in some ways, the, 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 I would think one of the most important signs of hope for the next generation of theologians is they themselves. Yeah. I mean, they should look in the mirror. The fact that they're here is a, is a great sign of hope. Michael? I would say Jesus Christ. Oh, <laughs> I, I, the Lord Jesus Christ. How Ultimately, good that our, he makes an appearance in the conversation. Uh, I thought our, Jesus would show uh, up at some point. Our, our, <laughs> our hope is in Him. He only and just made Saint, it in this. As Saint, <laughs> as Saint Paul says very well that hope that is seen is not hope. So if you get all of these things and stack them together and say, well, the local bishop can read and write, and the Father X can do Y, and so, and you add them up and say, that's that's not the reason for hope. The reason for hope is Christ. 
I think, and that um, the belief in Christ, I think, entails many of the things that we've talked about. But that having been said, there has to be concrete measures by which this hope can be implemented and instantiated. And I think that's the next stage for the church in the United States. Well, thank you both for being with us today. And I'm going to just close by disagreeing with something that Nicholas said uh, a while back. Uh, Nicholas raised the question, why are there no giants in theology at the present time? I'm going to suggest that there are giants in the the theology at the present time. I have two very good friends who qualify for that position. (laughs) Thank you both for being here. Only if you lower your standards.